anybody out there who's a little Pete fan, you guys know how talented he was. You guys know how great he was. Well, he was even more fucking great as a person. I met him in in London, and he's such a fucking good dude. And he was really, he was really like such a good guy. Such a talented fucking dude, and he was gonna fucking change music for fucking ever, and it sucks, dude. It sucks. If you look up Lil Peep's Twitter account, he called himself Goth Angel Sinner, and he did announce an EP called Goth Angel Sinner at one point, but I don't think he was that much of a sinner. I mean, we're all sinners at the end of the day, but should a person who succumbed to what made them feel some kind of happiness be considered worse than those that don't understand the person's struggles? It's debatable, but every situation is different, and they need to be understood. Addiction as a whole can't just be summarized by saying, if you don't do it, you won't get those issues. It's complicated, and to be honest, I don't want to focus too much on addiction, because Lil Peep was a human being that made music, and the music itself was really emotional and while admittedly I didn't like his music at first it did grow on me and with time I realized just how great Lil Peep was. My name is Gezm67 and the last documentary I made was on XXXTentacion and the response I got from it inspired me to make this one too. Most of the sources I used are from Lil Peep's interviews and his most personal interviews came from articles rather than videos which is a shame but regardless I hope this helps you out in some way. So let's start from the beginning. Lil Peep was born Gustav Elijah Orr on November 1st, 1996 in Allentown, Pennsylvania and spent most of his life on Long Island, New York, living in an area that he described as the shittiest fucking suburbs ever. When he was asked about his upbringing, he said, My upbringing was pretty regular. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I mean... I was around drugs early, but that's the only thing that's not regular, I'd say. In an interview he did with Hunger, Lil Peep said he spent most of his early years sitting in his room because he didn't relate to anyone around him at the time, which made him very reclusive. As a teenager, Lil Peep worked as an assistant at a seafood restaurant. Even though he got good grades in school, he became an outcast because of his interest in tattoos at a young age. Even though his tattoos alienated him from the students and adults at the school, he kept on getting more tattoos because he wanted to express himself. The things that mattered to him most were staying true to who he was, even if it meant losing friends in the process. He didn't like being in school in general. In an interview he did with Pitchfork, he said he would sit there for 45 minutes and be like, I cannot take this. He hated it so much that he had to hop a 20 foot fence to run away from the security guards every fucking day. Even though he was warned about the consequences, he couldn't care less. Eventually, he dropped out of high school and finished school in a low pressure online program that required only a single essay a week, which his mother usually ended up writing for him. He spent his teenage years holed up in his room, playing video games like Skyrim, and taking comfort in rap and punk records before eventually developing developing a fascination with weirder internet-based acts, which gave him an idea. He thought to himself, I should make music. In an interview he did with ID back in September 2017, he stated that once he found out that people were really making careers for themselves off the internet, independently, he was really inspired. My influence from, you know, listening to a lot of emo music growing up, and, uh, you know, hearing people like God Boy Click make it, you know, uh, just inspired me to do it myself. He started calling himself Lil Peep because since I was a small baby, my mom has called me Peep. I don't know why, Peepers. Peep, just, it's just what she calls me. Pretty much everyone in my life calls me Peep, so <laughs> Lil Peep. <laughs> he got the broken heart tattoo on his face when he was 17 years old to force himself to really do some shit. 
because getting a tattoo on your face is going to stop you from getting a lot of jobs. Before he graduated, he moved to California on a limb, not really having an idea on what he was going to do. He was roommates with fellow rapper Brennan Savage. He was willing to fight for his dream of becoming a successful musician, but there were hardships in the process. In the memorial, his mother said she sent him canned food, and he would spend his nights on making music and sleep during the day. After spending a year trying to figure out his sound, he released his first mixtape, Lil Peep Part 1, in 2015, and continued to release music over the years, gaining a following and eventually getting the attention of a rap collective called Schema Posse. Schema Posse was a hip-hop collective founded by Jay Green in 2015. Jay Green was looking for a singer to join the group, and through fellow rapper Craig Zan, he discovered Lil Peep. The collective had over 40 members, the most notable being Jay Green, Ghost Main, and Lil Peep. They did an interview of No Jumper, but a few days before the interview was uploaded on YouTube, Ghost Main announced he was no longer a part of Schema Posse, and left for unexplained reasons. But there wasn't any clarity on whether or not Lil Peep stayed of Schema Posse, but on September 16th, 2016, Goth Boy Click announced that Lil Peep was officially part of their group. So how did that happen? I was introduced to like Tracy and Horsehead and everyone by NetUp. NetUp uh, yeah. was uh, I think staying in my house at the time. Mm -hmm. And he and they, they were just invited him over and we just played. Like, how did you find the perfect chemistry with Tracy? I mean, the first day I met Tracy, we made white tea. Goth Boy Click was the perfect group for Lil Peep to be in. He went from going to a high school field of people he couldn't relate to, to being part of a rap group that he was emotionally connected to. As far as GBC shit, it's kind of like emotional trap music. There's a lot of the beats. Um, I mean, they have like, you know, trap elements like the high ass and the heavy 808s and shit. And then like, you know, the samples would be like punk songs or yeah. fucking, you know, shit with guitar and shit, so. Something along that type of line, like if, if pop, pop punk was like as uh, as relevant as it was maybe like 10 years ago, I think this would be like the newer version of what Lil Peep released a lot of music, whether it was solo mixtapes, collaborative mixtapes, EPs, or just the random features and other tracks he released on SoundCloud. Going back to his solo career, Adam22 asked him when he started rapping, and he said, I started rapping when I dropped out, and then I moved to California with Brennan, and we moved into the house that we're all staying in right now. How long ago did you move out here? A uh, month ago? I think that was 2013. Oh, okay. 14, maybe? Yeah. And so what, you just been working on the music thing ever since, or what? No, I moved out here, and uh, tried to do music but I couldn't mix myself and I got really frustrated for like a few months and then I couldn't pay the rent anymore went back to New York and then I was like fuck because I was back at my mom's house so I really wanted to get out again I started really going harder with the mixing and got better at it and shit and then people started to like my shit on SoundCloud and whatnot being raised in a generation where artists take a more DIY approach Lil Peep stated that he recorded almost all of his music in a bedroom with a microphone plugged into a 2012 MacBook with garage band that he used since he started making music. That includes the recording process of his debut album, Come Over When You're Sober Part 1. Shortly before the release, he had his debut tour in spring, with no label, no PR, no hits for his name at the time. And despite all that, he sold out every show, some to screaming crowds of several thousand. In an oversaturated market of SoundCloud rappers where everyone sounds the same, Lil Peep was able to stand out. He worked hard, he kept making music, and with time, he got to where he wanted to be. He went from being inspired by Sesh Hollow Water Boys and Goth Boy Click to working with them. He went from being lonely in his room feeling comfort with music music to becoming a musician that comforted others that were in the same position he used to be in. He went from being poor, living off canned food and sleeping on couches, to becoming rich and successful. I mean, yeah, you don't expect any of this to happen, but none of this, like, you don't get here without working really fucking hard, so once you're here, it's not like you're, like, surprised to be here, you know what I mean? But like once you're here, you're like, fuck, I've done so much. And like there's been so many, you know, sleepless nights and shit. Like are you really surprised you're here? Yeah. Yeah. The thing that made Lil Peep stand out was his influences. In an interview he did with Double XL, he said he grew up listening to a lot of emo music, a lot of rock music, a lot of rap music, a lot of trap music, funk, everything, from artists like McConan to Fall Out Boy. He would sample music that wasn't usually sampled in hip hop. Songs from bands like The Microphones and Radiohead, to electronic musicians like Yippa and Aphex Twin. Usually he sampled indie rock music, and it goes back to something I've said in one of my previous videos. Find inspiration from as many places as possible, ideally from places that haven't really been explored before. Whether 
he liked his music or not, there's no denying that he was able to make the rap genre evolve by incorporating different styles. Even if he's not the first rapper to incorporate indie rock, he's certainly one of the biggest to ever do it. He was able to make music that reached unexpected audiences. He has a huge following in Russia because it is one of the biggest scenes for metal, music that's dark, and the dark spin that Pete put on some of his music is appealing to them. And he went on to say that the fact that they show him so much love means a lot to him. In his interview with ID, he said music got him out of serious drug addiction, suicide, self-harm, the list goes on. Little Peep wanted to find an outlet that would help him, and music was able to do that. He made a lot of depressing songs, but it helped him out because he had an outlet for expressing himself that also helped his fans whenever they felt depressed. A lot of his music was focused on things that were going on in his life, like relationships, drug use. Talking about past experiences and uh, shit that people could relate to. Trying to make, you know, music that make people feel less alone. Unfortunately, Lil Peep's success had a negative impact on him too. Lil Tracy stopped being friends with Lil Peep because he felt that Lil Peep's rise in success was overshadowing golf boy click and he wasn't really giving the group as much respect as he should have. Despite this, Lil Peep still loved Lil Tracy and will always love him no matter what. I can't really blame Lil Tracy for feeling like that. I felt the same way at certain points in my life, but it's really sad how even something as rewarding as achieving your dreams can have some kind of consequence. Your music is very emotional and uh, people always cry to it and you know, yeah. find it really... Uh, what makes you sad and cry? Uh, uh, so many different things. Uh, I suffer from depression pretty bad and uh, yeah, I mean that, just like a lot of things like pile on top of each other and just kind of like fuck with me. I think I'm chemically imbalanced. On February 16th, 2017, he tweeted, I am a depressed drug addict and I'm nearing my breaking point. Everything I love is disappearing. When he was asked about this tweet in an interview, he said, When you start to uh, blow up as an artist, it starts to become, you know, more of a job and very, like, uh, mentally consuming of, the, you know, your thoughts. But you're still everything. depressed? Yeah, depressed. definitely. But for different reasons, for why? Uh, because you're doing great. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of different reasons. Uh, I have a pretty fucked up childhood. A lot of weird shit happened to me when I was really young. And I think it fucked, fucked my head. Depression and anxiety were brought onto him from a very young age and it followed him throughout his life. His anxiety affected the way he made music, the way he posted on social media. It even affected his live performances. In my first show, I threw up after every single song. Like, profusely. I was just vomiting. Why? Constantly. I was nervous. I didn't expect that many people to be there. It was near the Yeah, it was at an abandoned house, and we packed it out. I didn't expect it to be packed out, and so I vomited after every single song. And I was telling him that too. Did you feel better? No, I looked. Some songs I didn't even finish. I just had to go vomit, and I would just tell him I'd be like, I got here to go vomit, and they would let me. Yeah, I don't know. I'm very nervous performing on stage for it pretty bad, so I don't know. I'm a very awkward person. I have a lot of social anxiety. A lot of his music contains references to death, one of the most notable being the song OMFG from Hellboy, where he talked about wanting to kill himself. When he was asked about it, he went into more detail on his depression, saying that some days he would wake up and be like, fuck, I wish I didn't wake up, which turned out to be one of the reasons why he moved to California, trying to get away from the place that was doing that to him, and then he realised it was just himself, a chemical imbalance in the brain. He was introduced to drugs from a very young age, and during that time when he stayed in his room alone, he would take Xanax to make himself feel better. He also took Xanax before his interviews and live performances to calm him down, but the more he kept taking Xanax, the more dependent he became on them, which leads to a chapter that needs to be talked about. What are your favorite drugs? Uh, my favorite drugs? Uh, weed? Uh, Xanax? Uh, Percocet? Lean? Uh, it used to be, I used to do a lot of coke, but eh, ecstasy, molly, pretty much everything. And talking about pills like Xanax and Percocet, does it really help with anxiety and... Uh... Uh, the Xanax helps with anxiety, yeah. I mean, that's what's paid for it, so it just calms me down. Yeah. Because in some of the interviews you talked about, uh, you were lonely, playing Skyrim and shit, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so <laughs> Xanax helped with that. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it just kept me doing that, like, without, you know, fucking hurting myself. We're nearing the end, and this is a chapter that was bound to come up eventually. An addiction that can harm your physical or mental health is a really bad thing. I'm not referring to drugs, I'm talking about negative addictions in general. But it needs to be understood why Lil Peep had an addiction in the first place. He was depressed, and he found some kind of therapy and things that were designed to hurt him, like cocaine. People like to say Lil Peep could have lived if he just decided to quit, but it's not that easy. A lot of people dismiss the death of Lil Peep because there's a stigma about drug addicts. The people believe they bought everything on themselves, and if they never tried drugs in the first place, they would still be alive. I used to have that opinion too, and there is an element of truth to that, but every situation is different. Every person has their own reason for doing things that society doesn't accept, and he wasn't happy about his drug addiction. Substance abuse comes from a person relying on something that makes them feel a different way. There are some things that need to be understood about Lil Peep's situation with drugs, like how he actually had a lot more control than most people think. He said he used to abuse it really badly, taking 20 pills a day, having seizures in his sleep, waking up in his own shit, but he stopped abusing it. If he felt nervous, he would just do one and he was chill. He said this in his ID interview, which he did back in September 2017. When he was asked if he ever had an overdose, he said, Yeah, multiple times. And can you describe the experience? Just, I mean, I don't know. I fucking almost died that much times. <laughs> The 15th of November 2017 was Lil Peep's last day with us. There's a lot of significant things he posted on Twitter and Instagram that day that indicate the kinds of emotions he felt at the time. On the 14th, he posted a video of him taking Xanax. On the 15th, he posted two videos and four pictures. The first video was quite random. There isn't much to say about the video itself. The second video is him dancing to American Idiot by Green Day with the caption, I just took honey and shrooms. The second picture is him making a pose with the caption, I was homeless. The third picture is him with his tongue out with what appears to be Xanax with the caption, fuck it. You might have noticed I didn't read the caption for the first video, and I didn't mention the first picture at all. Like I said, there wasn't much to say about the video itself, whereas the caption for it, well, it says, I just want to be everybody's everything. I want too much from people, but then I don't want anything from them at the same time you feel me. I don't let people help me, but I need help, but not when I have my pills, but that's temporary. One day, maybe I won't. And then there's the first picture. Before I get to it, it's clear that I'm not mentioning what you already know. And the reason why is because I want Lil Peep to tell you in his own words. The song that's playing in the background was the first track on his first mixtape, and yet the lyrics play out like it was meant to be his last song ever. So please listen to what he has to say. Mm -hmm. What do you I'm think happens after that? You know, I don't know. You could you could just wake up again. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I'm not I'm not like I know there's something because you can't kill energy, you know what I mean? Energy doesn't die. It's literally like a fucking weird thing that like leaves your brain when you die. Like a you could see it on, on uh some cameras or some shit. You could see like a weird like I don't even know what the fuck to call it, but it leaves your brain and like just like floats out into like you know the atmosphere and whatever the fuck. So no, definitely not. And I feel the presence of a lot of people who have passed away too, just randomly. You know what I mean? They're just popping in my head. So there's another picture that I didn't mention, and I wanted to save it until last because it was his last Instagram post, and I hope it can reassure you in some way. It's a picture of his fans for the caption. Look at my beautiful fans. From looking at the things he posted on Twitter and Instagram that day, it's clear that Lil Peep had a lot of thoughts on his mind. On depression, drugs, death, and from where he was to where he got to. Nobody will ever truly know what Lil Peep's final thoughts were, but knowing that he was thinking of you guys shortly before he died should remind you that Lil Peep had a heart of gold. And while he didn't have the best life, he never forgot about the people that loved him. Amidst all the issues that Lil Peep had of drugs, anxiety and depression, he still tried to keep himself positive. When he was asked about suicide in his interview of Montreality, he said, I mean, shit, everything changes with time. Like, you can't, you can't predict where you're gonna be next year. You have no idea, you know what I mean? Like, 
there have been points like I've been in very, 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 very low points. Like, you know, shitty situations, horrible situations. And then I always, my mom always tells me that like, time will heal everything, you know what I mean? And even if it takes, even if it's like five years later and you're still feeling like, where the fuck, like when I'm waiting for this shit to heal, like it's nothing's happening. It's gonna take another, you know, few years, you know what I mean? That shit does take time in some situations, but you know, it will eventually get better. Things will get better. And also you have to be grateful for what you have. Never be ungrateful. It's when people start to be super, you know, like, oh, I hate my life, everything sucks. But it's like, you got shoes in your feet right now. You know what I mean? There's kids who don't have water, access to water in the world. So pretty much, yeah. There's people fighting to survive, so. There are two things I really want you to take from this documentary. I'll talk about the second thing in the next chapter, but the first thing is something that comes from Lil Peep himself. Live on for them, you know what I mean? Live the life they wish they could live. Lil Peep didn't get the chance to live a long life. I can't speak for every single person watching this because everyone's dealing with their own circumstances. Don't forget that even in those times where you feel that your life isn't worth living, there are people who do care about you. And that life is a gift which is a lot more precious than it may seem. Live on for Lil Peep. Because even if you do feel lonely, Lil Peep will live forever in spirit and his music will live forever too. In his interview with XXL, he said his goal in music is to save people's lives like how his life was saved. He was very suicidal, depressed and addicted to drugs and a lot of different artists helped him get out of that with their direct lyrics. Sometimes you feel like an artist is talking directly to you and with that, think of Lil Peep's music as your own personal therapy. He would have wanted to see you happy. Going into more depth on positivity, Lil Peep was also a very generous person. He stated in interviews that he would give his jewellery away to fans. He was known for his face tattoos, and while some of them were random, like the Get Kicked Die Young tattoo that he didn't remember getting, he had another tattoo. On my face, I got a humongous tattoo that says crybaby and shit to keep me grateful and remind me not to be a crybaby, so I see it every time I look in the mirror, you know, to remind me that I'm blessed. A couple of months ago, I bought this t-shirt that says Crybaby to keep me grateful and to remind me of Lil Peep. It's official merchandise, which I'll link in the description. The reason why I'm bringing it up is when I got the shirt, it came with a note that I believe comes with any purchase you make from Lil Peep's website. The note says, Dear Lil Peep fan, Gus had a vision of the world he wanted to share. The vision of love, innovations, creativity, and freedom. He was gracefully transparent in his struggles and triumphs. Gus showed his fans in the world they are not on this journey alone. Gus was a voice for those who didn't have a voice. A voice for those who couldn't express what they were feeling. Gus's message deserves to live on. Through his music, art and fans, he will be immortal. For that, we thank you, all of you, from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for sharing Gus's vision. Thank you for keeping his spirit alive. You are not alone. There is hope. We should appreciate the lives of the ones we love while they're still with us. Which leads to my final point. If you have any family, friends, or people you're a fan of that you truly appreciate, tell them how much you love them. Tell them right now, tell them a bit later, as long as you don't forget to do it. Life is short and you never know when their lives might end. And you never know when your life might end. If you know someone you care about that you're currently not on good terms with, whether it be from a simple argument to something a lot more serious, please try to patch things up with that person. Death can come at any moment and I truly believe that we take life for granted. And I'm not saying you should constantly think about how much you appreciate the ones you love while they're still alive, because we're always going to take things for granted while we still have them. But like I said, if there's any issues you have with someone that can be resolved, please do it before it's too late, because the last thing you want is to lose someone before you can tell them how much you love them. I think I've said everything I needed to say in this documentary. I'm gonna let the people that were closest to Lil Peep end it because the words they say are better than anything I could ever say about him. My name is Gazem67, thank you for watching this and this is for you Gus. Gus created something out of nothing. Gus talked his entire career into existence. We would sit around in Gus's room, listening to his music, and at that moment, we didn't realize what an impact he would make. I always did think Gus had what it took to be a successful artist, and it is really still a shock of how much of an impact he did make. It's just crazy to watch it all come to life before your eyes. It felt like only months would pass, and Gus would be working with artists that he had always looked up to for years, and he'd been listening to their music forever. His career advanced so quickly, and it made me and all my friends so happy to see him succeed. When most of our friends would go to the bar or a party, it would just be me and Gus and a couple friends just hanging out in Gus's room just smoking weed. We would stay up all night, literally until like 5 in the morning. Liza would always come in every day, almost, and just tell us to turn it down. But Liza would never ever be angry. Never once was she really angry at Gus. She knew that this is what Gus needed to do to get 
to move on in his career. She knew that showing him support and giving him as much freedom and support as possible was what he needed to succeed in his career. And without that, I don't think that Gus would have ever made it this far in his career. Gus worked really hard to get where he got. He stayed up until 5 or 6 a.m. every single day. Liza would always tell me that she would walk into his room in the morning and when she was going to work and he would always just still be up working every day. Gus knew what he wanted in life and he chased after it with everything he had in him. His style and creative vibe will never be duplicated. He lived the life of a rock star and I know he wouldn't have wanted it any different. I will always miss you and love you Gus. I met Gus in third grade. We were eight years old. A close family friend passed away that year. And I remember I got to sit crying on the big comfy beanbag chair all day by myself. My Gus just kept coming over to me to make me laugh. He was the only person to cheer me up that day. I wish he was here right now cheering me up. By fifth grade, I was in love with him. He was just so cool from the start. I mean, I've never met anyone who's colored their hair more times than me. <laughs> Middle school came and we stayed friends. I remember he'd go on for hours making fun of the guys I dated. But no matter what he was saying, I couldn't stop laughing at it. He was so funny, he would make you laugh so hard you wouldn't realize he's been making fun of you for the past 10 minutes. <laughs> He'd make me laugh until I'd cry. I don't think it's physically possible to shed more tears for anyone. High school came and we went back and forth, breaking each other's hearts. We'd date for a month and he'd hate each other for two, but he was always there and he always reassured me how much he loved me. Even if he was pissed at me, even in the hardest times when I thought no one was there, he was. He was just always there. Senior year came and he finally showed me some public affection. He was never too good at that. He kissed me in front of a whole party. I remember thinking, wow, we're really gonna be in a real relationship this time. It didn't happen immediately, but eventually. He moved to California after high school, and so did I. He was in LA, I was in San Diego. He was living with Brennan with no job or money at all, eating only the Trader Joe's canned beans Liza would send him in a box from New York. <laughs> I went up there every other week with my two-week pay of $100. I was working for my sister. I think he wore the same, same pants every single day that year. And for some odd reason, it never grossed me out. He'd step out of his pants that were literally molded to his legs. They were so stale, they would stand up straight. <laughs> and I never even flinched. I mean, that's true love, if you ask me. He eventually moved back home to Long Beach. I think it took him took me maybe two months to run back after him. Might as well have just immediately moved all my stuff into his tiny room because I don't think I slept in my own bed more than 10 times that year. I was glued to him. I hated working. I didn't want to be away from him, which was pretty strange because we did absolutely nothing but sit in his room every day. <laughs> I'd watch him smoke the clips people left at his house the night before <laughs> because either he didn't want to leave his house to get weed, Ian wasn't around, or he had no money to buy it, which was usually the case. But he never worried about that. He always knew he'd have all the money he needed one day. He always knew he'd be something more. And I can truly say, I don't think anyone who really knew him ever doubted that. He had to start kicking me out of his house so he could record. He would tell me he couldn't sing in, sing in front of me until he was famous. And then it all started to change. It started to happen. He started to have a fan base, girls started commenting on his pictures, and I started freaking out on him every other day. <laughs> But no matter how much we fought, he wouldn't stop telling me how much he loved me. We'd break up and the next minute I'd get a text from him saying I love you. He made it so hard to ever be mad at him. He'd tell me no what, matter what, Emma, you're always my family. And I didn't really know what he meant by that until now. But now I get it, because I feel like I've lost the closest thing to me. But you know what makes it feel a little better? Knowing he's right here by my side. <laughs> Knowing how much he hated to see me cry. There's an empty hole in my heart, but with every single beat, I can feel you shining through it. You are my soulmate, and souls never die. You live through me, you live through all of us.
He lived his own life on his own terms. He was a stubborn, driven, talented, crafty, observant, and tender young man. Gus was also vulnerable. Gus understood that many good people suffered injustice because of what they looked like or how much money they had. He saw how the cool kids who lived in the fancy neighborhoods looked down on his friends who lived in the projects and looked down on his own family who lived in an apartment and drove an old Nissan. Gus got fed up with that world. He rejected it and he rejected being molded into a box. Probably Emma, Ian, and Carmelo know more about why he began to feel that way. When he locked himself in the garage and got his first tattoo, he began to make his rejection of the box public. He dared the world. That's when some of his friends' parents told their sons and daughters they didn't want him to hang around with Gus. He cried when he told me about that. That's when the adults at the high school began to look at him askance. He set his jaw when he told me about that. With a keen eye for injustice, Gus raised the ante. He added to his tattoo. He pierced various parts of his face, his ears, nose, lip, eyebrow. The more tattoos and piercings he got, the more he was treated like an outsider, and the more of an outsider he became. Being an outsider, a reject, hurt him. He stayed in his room, barely mustering the courage to go to the library to complete the assignments necessary to get his diploma. Years later, Gus told me that it was easy to tell the difference between the people who saw his tattoos when they looked at him and the people who saw him. Gus decided to move to California and left at 17. He tried to take classes, but few were available to an out-of-state resident. It was there that he discovered he could express his sorrow and joy and despair with his music. When he returned to Cal from California, he began to make music at our home. My mother bought him some beats and explained to me why I should take this work seriously. So he and I drove to Best Buy and I bought him a pair of fancy red earphones. He worked and worked and worked. He made me wear earplugs at night so I wouldn't hear him, but I did hear him belting it out. He worked like that typically through the night, going to sleep when I got ready for work. If you had seen Gus walking down the street, you might have been put off, scared even. You might have thought, what a loser, or yikes, I had better cross the street. If you had known he stopped caring about school, you might have thought, what a loser, and I don't want my kid hanging around with him. He could get into some bad habits. If you had seen his filthy fingernails, you might have run away. If you had made these judgments about this teenager, about this young man struggling on his own to find meaning as a man, then I ask you to use this moment right now as a time to reflect on your actions. Ask yourself these questions. Do I really know this person? Have I sat down face to face and asked him to tell me about himself? Do I know what matters to him? Do I know what he values? What hurts him? What he loves? And why? Am I assuming this strange or scary looking person has no plans for himself? Have I asked him his plans? Am I dismissing this person because he does not match my definition of a good kid? Do I assume he does not work? Be honest. Gus was. Gus wrote a song about wanting to burn his high school down. He didn't like most of the adults there. He despised the social scene. Must everyone fit into the box? Why must we have a box? Who is this box for? Can we reinvent ourselves? Gus has left us with so much to think about and learn from. I want to thank you all for coming here today. Please do not make assumptions about people or events in ignorance. Do you understand what I'm saying? Try to step outside of your own box and open your mind to new ideas. My sweet little peeper is gone now, but he has surely left us a lot of wonderful material to review and consider. He has left me with new people to know. I am so proud of him. You have no idea.